Hello, and welcome everyone to our presentation and conversation about an upcoming year of unprecedented action around the world aptly titled Elections Everywhere All at Once. My name is Graham Brookie. I'm the Senior Director of the Digital Forensic Research Lab, as well as the Vice President of the Atlanta Council for Technology Programs. In 2024, over 75 countries will hold over 80 national level legislative or executive elections, including countries like India, Mexico, Ukraine, Senegal, the member states of the European Union, and of course, in the United States. The sum total of elections will include over 4.2 billion people, which means over half of the world's population will be heading to the polls in some shape or form. According to The Economist, 2024 is the largest election year by sheer volume in world history. Now, not only election, or not all elections are equal, free, fair, or guaranteed to shape de democratic outcomes. As an example, Russia is holding an election which is not expected to alter Vladimir Putin's authoritarian grip on that country. And all of these elections are occurring at a time when the way by which citizens interact in public discourse is increasingly online. Private social media platforms continue to grapple with the governance duties and responsibilities of their impact in countries they happen to be headquartered in, as well as in far-flung lands. Today's conversation will explore those dynamics and their consequences as the stakes for global democracy could not be higher. I would like to thank all of our excellent panelists for joining us today. I would also like to thank our partners at Duco and Anchor Change uh, for co-hosting with us today. Duco empowers leading companies to operate safely, securely, and responsibly by mobilizing the world's leading experts to solve complex challenges like the one I just described. And Anchor Change is a newsletter from DFR Lab non-resident senior fellow Katie Harbaugh, which provides reporting and analysis of what's happening in the, around the world at the intersection of democracy and technology. Finally, and especially, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. You can follow along with us today on Zoom or on YouTube. Uh, if you'd like to get into the conversation, go to askac.org, again, askac.org and click on this event ele uh, titled Elections Everywhere All at Once to submit your question. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as humanly possible today. Uh, and of course, you can follow us on social media. We're basically everywhere, Facebook, Twitter X, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Blue Sky, Threads, everywhere. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and my colleague, uh, Katie Harboth, uh, who is not only a non-resident senior fellow at uh, the DFR lab, but also was the head of public policy at Facebook in a prior life. Uh, she's going to start us off with a presentation before we get into conversation. And with that, again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you on the internet. Great. Thank you so much, Graham, and thank you all for joining us. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart that I've been talking about for a very long time. And I'm excited that this year is finally upon us. And I wanna take this opportunity before we get to our great panels to kind of set the stage for you a little bit um, and beyond what Graham sort of shared with you. And so we're gonna pull up, I've got some slides here that we're gonna be showing. And one of the terms I've been using as we look to next year is whirlwind. There are so many different aspects that are going to be playing off of one another next year that it's sort of very hard to predict where we're going to be this time next year. Um, and so really quickly, Graham mentioned I spent 10 years at Facebook where I helped build the teams that work with politicians and governments and how to use the platform. And then I also managed the company's work on elections globally from 2013 to the end of 2019. Um, some of my work, in addition to my newsletter, I work with the Atlantic Council, the Bipartisan Policy Center, the International Republican Institute, and others at sort of this intersection of technology and democracy. So as Graham mentioned, it's an unprecedented year of elections next year. It's the first time ever that in the same year as the U.S. presidential elections, you do have those elections in India, Indonesia, Taiwan, maybe Ukraine, Mexico, the United Kingdom, the European Parliament. They're touching every single continent and over 4.2 billion people are going to be affected by what happens. This makes this a huge geopolitical moment. Many of these countries are in the G7, the G20, BRICS, 
And on top of that, for technology companies and others, these are many fronts in which to have to protect the integrity of elections online and how these problems manifest themselves are going to be different in each of these places. And I'm really excited for our panelists to dig into that. Really quickly, some of the current state of play of, of where we're looking at with all this. To start with the companies, I put this sort of in three buckets. You first have the legacy companies, many of whom are going to be represented on, on one of our panels, that are still doing a ton of work around trust and safety in elections. Layoffs have impacted them. Their policies are changing. However, this is also an ever-changing environment. And it's always sort of hard to know um, what impact everything will absolutely have until you actually kind of get through everything. And I'm excited for some of these representatives to share some of the work that their companies are doing on all of this. I put X slash Twitter in its own bucket because the layoffs there have affected, have been much more drastic. We have been seeing a lot more um, different approaches that Elon Musk and others have been taking to this work um, of what is happening. And so it's just a little unpredictable what role X will play in next year's election. So it will still definitely play a role. You also have what makes 2024 unique is that you have many newer platforms that for whom this is going to be the first major election cycle that they are having to deal with. This includes TikTok, Substack, Discord, Twitch, Telegram, many others, and we'll dig into that in some of our panels, but they have not necessarily had the time to build up the same tools and policies and processes that some of the legacy companies have had, though they're still doing work around this. It's just none of these things are a flip of the switch and to be able to create them right away. Um, we also have in terms of civil society is very much, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. This is the next slide. Um, we're looking at US politics um, and you've got a polarized environment here in the US. You also have campaigns who are very much um, looking at different ways in which you use some of these technologies and everything that is happening. You also have, am I one slide off? I cannot see what's in my, I'm so sorry, everyone. I'm trying to be professional, but I also can't see where my slide's at. Um, and so uh, we also have, oh, I'm going to go back. Oh, I am so sorry, everyone. I have a app that's helping me to navigate these slides and it's having a mind of its own at the moment. So apologies for me while I try to navigate this back to where we need to go. Okay, it's just gonna stay right there. Um, let me go through this and then we'll get to the around the world. Um, US politics, we have a very polarized electorate that we are going into and a lot of questions about the role of social media and governments in this. Campaigns are trying these new tools and they're gonna be using things like AI in which to do this. We have the courts that are gonna be playing a huge role in this election. The Supreme Court is looking at you know, three different types of cases, one about how government officials can use social media and if they can uh, ban people from engaging on those platforms, whether or not states like Texas and Florida can tell companies how to moderate content on their platforms. And then we also have um, Martha V. Martha v. By, um, Missouri that's going to be looking at whether or not that relationship between government and social media all of these are gonna be heard this term and those decisions will come down in the middle of next year while these elections are happening. Moreover, you have civil society that is trying to hold a lot of these companies accountable, share what is happening in their countries around elections and information integrity. Um, a lot of them are sort of, you know, they, they're not always sure how to reach out to the tech companies and how to engage them. And they too just aren't quite sure what will be protected or not. In academia, you have many folks who are trying to figure out what is or is not allowed in terms of engagement with um, some of these social media platforms and some of the research that they are doing. And you also have a media landscape that is changing and a me traditional media who are trying to figure out um, what it, how to best cover these some of these candidates and some of this work that is actually happening. Around the world, now that I'm getting caught up to my own slides, um, just really quickly of what we're seeing in some of these countries. In India and in other places, you have suppression of journalists. You have um, folks trying to potentially make changes to the powers of the electoral commissions. You have a lot of potential threat of violence that's going to be happening as part of this. Many of these countries have their own laws that are, you know, on the surface are meant to help fight fake news, but there's a lot of concerns that it could be used to uh, silence um, opposition voices, 
or ask companies to take down content that they wouldn't normally want to take down. You also have still the threat of foreign interference. Um, obviously, China and Taiwan is going to be one that many people are going to be looking at, but we still have many threats, and I'm sure the panelists will somewhat go into this, of um, China, Russia, Iran, and others who will be trying to interfere in elections all around the globe. Um, and then you also have places like the United Kingdom and the EU that have new regulations that they have recently enacted that are going to be starting to be enforced in the middle of all of these elections. Going, coming back here to the United States really quickly, um, this is also going to be a huge year of advertising and spending. It's projected to be a $10 billion spend, a lot of that on down ballot races here in the United States. But one thing that I am really looking at as part of this, though, is that while a lot of that money is going to be on broadcast, most people have switched and are watching streaming television. Um, linear TV dropped below 50% in the U.S. this summer. And so that disconnect of where advertising dollars will be spending versus where people are spending their time is something I'm definitely keeping an eye on. I'm also keeping an eye on podcasts. Um, this is a, some numbers from Sirius XM. Pew has also showed that a lot of people trust what they're hearing from podcasts a lot more than they might be from traditional broadcasts or um, cable news. And you see a lot of candidates, particularly on the Republican side here in the US, doing that podcast circuit for interviews and stuff like that. You're also seeing trends differ in terms of how people are getting their news and information. Gen Z very much prefers to pay independent creators and be looking at folks that are doing this type of content across a lot of platforms and not necessarily traditional news, but news influencers, which takes us to as well how a lot of Gen Z is getting their breaking news from um, Instagram and TikTok. And so this will be something that we're definitely be watching as we're going into next year. So really quickly looking ahead before we get to our panelists, AI too is just gonna be accelerant to all of this um, and is going to bring us new challenges and new things. This is very much the hot topic du jour, but it is not the only one that we should definitely be paying attention to this year. Political advertising, different platforms are handling political advertising differently. You are seeing a lot of discussion about whether or not AI use in political ads should be allowed and if it should be labeled. Uh, I think some of our panelists would definitely talk about that and the work that they're doing on that front. Um, but there's also a lot of questions too, I think we should be asking about how broadcast, cable, and other places will think about using this AI-generated content. Campaigns are gonna be trying to figure out whether or not to use TikTok or not due to the national security concerns. And again, you might see them trying to get creative of using influencers versus having their own accounts on these platforms. Text messaging in the US is still very huge when it comes to, to politics and we expect to see campaigns using that a lot. And then the tech companies will be doing a lot of work here and it will be ever evolving and it'll be important to keep an eye on what they are doing and what those differences look like. And finally, what does this mean for you? Um, I think just expect a lot of very rapid change. You need to be flexible and adaptable. While I don't expect any legislation to come from Congress this year on this, you do need to keep an eye out what's happening in the US states around some of these laws. I suspect that we'll keep seeing congressional hearings happen around many of these topics. Definitely keep an eye on the, on the courts. I think some of this conversation as well, will continue to talk about the need for transparency from these platforms and oversight not only in terms of what the platforms do, but what the governments around the world are doing and what they're asking of them. Campaigns are going to be thinking through a lot of different plans, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's a tool that campaigns say at this time next year help them win that doesn't even exist yet um, or is very much in, in early stages. And if you haven't played around with any of these tools, even today, many of um, the folks that we have on here have announced new tools around AI, um, and I'd highly encourage you to... Um, to take a look at those. Thank you for bearing with me with some of my technical um, glitches as part of all of this. The last thing I'll leave with you all with before I turn this over to Rose is uh, my mantra for next year is to panic responsibly as we're going into all of this. And so that is sort of, as we go into these conversations, thinking about how we can be diligent about the problems that might arise, but always how we can also try to mitigate those problems. So with that, Rose, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Katie, for that roundup. Um, and to all of you for joining us. It's it's my pleasure to turn to our first panel for the day, um, focusing on the global community of players required to ensure that elections are free, fair, accessible, all of the good things that we hope for. 
Um, and this will allow us to have uh, a conversation really about what this looks like around the world in a lot of different contexts. We're really lucky to be joined by an incredible array of experts. So I wanna start off by introducing them before we dig in. First up, we have Pumzile Van Dam, who is a former member of the South African Parliament. She was the Shadow Minister for Communications and Digital Technologies during her time there. She currently serves as a Technology and Human Rights Fellow at the Carr Center at Harvard and focuses her activism and research on addressing disinformation, online violence against women, and other social media related harms. Uh, we are also joined by Patricia Campos Mello, who is a well-known established Brazilian journalist who, though she has spent 25 years covering issues around the world, is best known for her work uncovering the use of WhatsApp to manipulate public opinion and how political actors in Brazil, India, and the US have used disinformation to advance their interests. Uh, we are finally joined by Kay Spencer, who is currently at the National Democratic Institute and a member of the Integrity Institute, which Katie Harbath herself helped to create, but was previously a member of Meta's Trust and Safety uh, team, where she worked on elections and other issues, and before that, a good deal of time on rule of law issues internationally with the U.S. Institute for Peace. Uh, so I can't think of a, a better grouping of people to help us navigate what is really an interlocking community around the world responsible for ensuring that elections go in the direction that we want. We only have 30 minutes here, so we want to cover a lot of ground. Uh, and I have some specific questions for each of you, but I was hoping we could start a little bit more broadly. Um, and I'm curious, uh, just a quick popcorn for all of you. Why do you think it matters that there are so many elections this year? And what Katie described as kind of the changing landscape of new regulations and shrinking resources for companies, what's the impact and particularly the impact in different parts of the world? Perhaps I can start with you, Pumzile. Yes, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think it matters because usually when there's an election, you know, the global community is watching. They're seeing what, what the rolling news coverage is in the US um, and the entire global community is watching and holding it accountable. And because there's so many elections, I think uh, there will be distraction um, and the kind of advocacy and activism that the global community plays won't be there. So I think it's really incumbent on us to have these type of conversations, not only to kind of highlight where the issues are, but also strategize um, in kind of, I guess, a division of labor um, and make sure that we have an eye on as many elections as we can. Absolutely. Patricia, how about you? Well, I think if we think about what happened in Brazil uh, this year on January 8th, that they had the several attacks against uh, the capital, people uh, disputing the election results. And we had this before on January 6th, 2021 in the US. Um, I think the important thing to, to see is, uh, have we learned anything about this election denialism and how to deal with it and how to deal with this anti-democratic movements and how are the, the big tech, the platforms going to react about this? And I think this could be happening in several other countries. Uh, unfortunately, we might see this uh, electoral denialism just spreading around and how are we going to deal with this? Absolutely. And Kay, if you can round us out for our first question of the day. Sure, thank you. Um, to build on, first, thank you for having me. Um, to build on what Pumzile and Patricia have been saying, 2024 is a big year, but elections are always important in 2023 and 2024 and beyond. Um, this is a big year for platforms and how they will manage um, all the elections that are coming up. Uh, 2024 is a culmination of trends that have been designed to erode trust in institutions. And I think what's key here is to keep focus on these smaller elections as well as the big ones. Um, what we've seen in the past is that we know authoritarians use these smaller elections as a testing ground for tactics to use in bigger elections later on. So let's, let's keep in mind um, the bigger picture, not just the big elections. Excellent. Um, that's a, a wonderful kind of starting point. And I, I wonder, Patricia, if I can turn to you, because you you really were early on the scene in identifying the impact that social media could have on elections. Uh, and I'm curious, as you're looking at what's happening now, and particularly kind of the last 10 crazy years of everyone coming into awareness that the internet matters, learning how to leverage the internet for their own purposes, 
and then the community trying to figure out how to then come back around and make sure that it could still be a productive place. Do things look different to you? Are the kind of tactics changing, the prevalence changing, are the actors different or the impact? I wonder if you could just share a little bit about what you're seeing both for 2024 uh, and, and in the years to come. Uh, definitely, Rose. I think, um, well, if I can talk about a little bit about Brazil, we had in 2018 um, lots of uh, WhatsApp uh, groups and misinformation spreading through WhatsApp groups. And then last year for our the, the uh, 2022 uh, presidential election, we had uh, Telegram, as uh, Katie was mentioning, Telegram was a big actor, uh, TikTok was a big actor. Uh, and not only that, but the fact that uh, you we have to pay attention to what platforms are changing in their moderation policies, not only in the US, but in other countries, in, in Brazil and other countries, we can notice that they are not as uh, strict as they were or not enough in, in the US. So to follow if they are changing and adapting to the misinformation, disinformation uh, techniques that uh, political actors are developing, how they are enforcing this, if they are actually enforcing it well. And another thing that was mentioned about the courts, because many of these countries, including Brazil and others, don't have regulations in place to deal with this. We depend on courts and it's always very dangerous to depend on whatever one judge or another is going to decide uh, and just try to remove content. And so I think these uh, things are changing. The techniques are changing and also the landscape in terms of moderation policy and, and what, how the judicial branch is going to deal with this and all that. I, I'm really glad that you pointed that out because it's been a, a conversation across civil society globally looking at models of how one country handles things versus another. And it's often raised that Brazil is unique in having light on the courts at key moments. Uh, and yet also, as you mentioned, if the political dynamics change or a certain individual in a legal system uh, has different ideas that that can suddenly become uh, more dangerous. So it is, it's a constant international process, um, which I think is, is a good segue into Kay, if I can ask you, you know, you've been working with global civil society in, in many regions in the world, uh, and in particular on how do you navigate communities where trust is low or zero, which is something that in the United States we're perhaps coming a little more into recently, but certainly around the world, that's not a, a new thing in the context of elections. Um, you know, when you're doing work around domestic observation missions or civil society trying to play a role, you know, we'd often talk about how it's sometimes just as important to create a path for people to trust that an election was credible as it is to make sure that you're catching some sort of nefarious activity to undermine an election or steal the results. Um, I'm curious in the context we're walking into with all of these elections and with the digital world that is increasingly hard for people to trust and navigate, what is it that you think civil society globally needs to be ready for and what kind of role can it and does it need to play? Sure. So I think civil society, um, especially doing um, election observation. Sorry, I should pause. Is there a feedback for anyone else? There is for me as well. These are it, we wouldn't be having an election technology <laughs> conversation if something didn't go slightly amiss with the AV. Um. Okay, I can, it, oh, it's back. Should I power through? <laughs> if you prefer, we can certainly switch to another one, but I think it's okay for now. Uh, and we'll let you know uh, if we have to bump to another question. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so as far as what civil society needs, um, especially for this digital moment, um, they need timely and affordable access to platform API to be able to monitor the information environment. Um, you know, for for decades, civil society has been able to help build trust in institutions and credible elections by um, conducting observation missions that help them accurately assess the process of an election. Um, you know, civil society can independently verify the process and official results of elections. Um, doing that, they can help instill confidence in um, election management bodies as appropriate. Um, you know, these tactics that we've been relying on for decades, again, can help deter manipulation and detect it. 
And, you know, they help build trust and confidence in participating in elections by suggesting the true election result and reducing the potential for post-election violence by posting credible process and verification results. Thank you. Um, we're going to come back to some some pieces of that, I think, in a bit. But I want to first turn to Pumzila, who I think has, you know, you have a unique experience in that you've run in one office. Uh, you're now on the outside. Uh, and I'm curious, a two part question. First, do you think it's different today and in this campaign cycle to run as a candidate? Than when you ran, and if so, how? And then I'll come back to you. No, no, absolutely. So I was first election elected in 2014. Social media was big, but it's not as big. I think around I was in parliament until 2021. And in 2019, I think that was when I personally first experienced just how difficult it is to be a, a candidate online, to be particularly a woman. Um, you know, you have to contend with a barrage of hate, threats of rape, deep fakes. And I think beyond just the mental health consequences it has for candidates, I think it's kind of dissuading a lot of younger people, younger women from wanting to be in politics. Um, and we need more young people. We need more, more young women. And I think I'm glad today that as part of the conversations, the platforms are here, or at least staff from the trust, trust and safety side of the platforms are here. I've been trying to do something different from um, and being this side in civil society an activist, is I found that the relationship between civil society and policymakers and the platforms is very acrimonious. It's one where there is distrust on both sides and where there isn't a conversation uh, about understanding what the challenges are with the platforms regarding what they can do and what the challenges are for political candidates. So I, I would really <clears throat> kind of encourage um, the platforms to kind of have some sort of open dialogue with candidates about what their challenges are. Um, and it's the fact that younger people and women are not running for political office to be seen as a real and big challenge where the platforms need to kind of have guardrails that make it easier for uh, young people to be in, in politics. I think that's a duty, I suppose, that they should kind of take on and see as something necessary for global democracy. I'm really glad you mentioned that because I, I feel like it's an, it's an issue that's often raised, but maybe not centered, just that women have to exist in these digital spaces that are becoming increasingly hostile to them. And it may be one thing to say, you know, well, fine, you don't have to be on name the platform if you don't want to. But if you choose to run for office, you really don't have a choice, right? Like there's, there's not yeah. really a path to communicating with the general public and competing. Um, so I'm curious, and, and this is a question for you and frankly, all of our panelists, what do you think would help address those extra threats that women face in trying to just compete to be part of the political system if that is in fact something we think is important to democracy? You mentioned, Puzila, just now, some things that you think um, uh, companies can do in talking directly with candidates. Are there other things that you think civil society or governments could be better prepared to do leading into this, this election cycle? And then I'll, I'll come back to the rest of the panelists with the same question. No, absolutely. Um, I think also it's a generational issue. So I'm 40 um, and I am kind of older millennial, uh, still part of the generation of thick skin. You know, they used to say in politics, take a spoonful of cement and toughen the F up. Um, but I think for, for younger people where they've, they, they've tried to make the online experience kinder, I think on TikTok, where a lot of kind of Gen Z uh, generation is, I see there's so much kindness. I'm like, wow, people are really nice to each other. Um, and for uh, other people, my generation and, and upwards, we're just used to this environment where, you know, you must just toughen up. So I'd really, I don't know, it sounds very... Sufi and not important, but I think just the cause of making the internet a kinder and safer space is important. Um, and if the platforms can do that, and I think it's important also for civil society to be able to accurately measure the violence that women experience online. And being an African, I think a challenge for Africa is that 
Um, the access to APIs has made it prohibitively expensive, where a lot of civil society organizations just, you know, struggle to kind of properly communicate the problems because they have the 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 access to to data as as a problem. Um, particularly with uh, I struggle to call it X Twitter, um, where you know researchers just don't have the accurate information to be able to quantify that issue. Um, and that's certainly something that uh, needs to be addressed. Thank you. From one ger geriatric millennial to the other, uh, I'm curious if the other panelists want to jump in on this, this question, because I do, it, it is very easy to shove it off as being, you know, it's the woman question. But I think, uh, you know, even as you're talking about people being kinder in the, in, in the internet space, certainly I'm sure every single one of our trust and safety colleagues that will be doing a panel next uh, are thinking of the horrible things that they see online uh, every day that they're having to try and keep, uh, in particular, kids safe. Um, so it, it is a rough environment. But, you know, what do you have to say about how it is or why it would matter that particular subsets of communities can or can't participate in political processes in the Internet? I guess uh, Patricia or Kay, whoever wants to go first. I can start. Um, well, I think I, I agree with Pumzile. Um, one of the things is it acts as a, a censorship. Uh, because it totally excludes and intimidates several voices online. We've had this very strongly in the last few elections in, in several countries. I would say that the US, India, and Brazil were particularly bad, and the Philippines as well, in terms of targeting women uh, polit politicians, activists, and journalists. And there's been uh, some, I mean, people have been raising awareness, but at the same time, what we are seeing, for instance, uh, in X or Twitter, uh, we it was one of the most toxic environments uh, in elections past, but then there was some awareness. They had some hotlines to, you know, uh, s stop these massive uh, attacks against uh, some women. But I'm not sure how th this is going to work, uh, these elections next year. Uh, uh, I think the other platforms uh, have implemented some mechanisms that help, uh, you know, diminish this sort of targeting. It's still not solved, of course. And it's very unfortunate that I know many, many women are really discouraged and are not participating in, in civic life because of this. So uh, I would hope that the platforms continue to do, uh, you know, to enforce uh, their policies to avoid uh, this environment to getting so toxic. Okay, if you want to jump in, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Yes, I, I don't know that I could add anything uh, that hasn't already been said, but rather just to reinforce this really key point of access to data for civil society to be able to do that monitoring that's needed and um, effective ac uh, advocacy to the platforms and more broadly to governments and globally. Um, I think you know this problem of increasing surveillance and attacks online is a really serious issue that is a problem for democracy. And to your point about what can platforms do, I think really making sure that the trusted partner networks that you have are clearly established, that the people that you've been speaking with know how to reach you if your team has shifted um, size or scope or main points of contact. Um, from what I know of our networks, I think folks are anticipating that things will work the way they have been working because they haven't had very effective outreach from platforms, at least as of yet. So increasing that initiative as well, I think could be something that would be very helpful to address this problem. That's a, a great way to segue into uh, another question that I wanted to, to raise with you, which is, I mean, we've been at this for a while, right? We've had a good 10 to 20 years of of experimenting and learning and practicing together, uh, and I'm I'm curious, what do you think the broader community has learned well, and what are you worried about? What are the gaps? Um, do you think that we are, you know, doing well on? Uh, you were just mentioning Kay, and I think also Patricia. You mentioned hotlines that had been established. Kay, you talked about people having, uh, you know, regular points of contact and understanding who they're supposed to talk to. Um, what are the things that you saw work in the past and you would hope to see in the future, uh, whether that is something that governments did to talk to each other or to, to provide support to civil society, or whether it was companies structuring themselves in certain ways to be able to be ready for what happens during elections. Uh, I wonder if I could start with UK this time. 
Sure, thank you. Um, I mean, I think over time, it was the relationships that civil society had with their points of contact at the platforms that made the advocacy and issues that they were seeing online much easier to raise. Um, I think through that regular communication, civil society got a better understanding of how to frame certain issues that they were having so that the messages that they were giving to platforms were, you know, more effective and would land um, were easier to make a business case. Um, you know, I think the the other thing that's built up over time are on the civil society side, these global networks and coalitions of groups that can reinforce and support and leverage the work that one another are doing. And so I hope that that will continue, um, even if in this moment of uh, churn on the platform side, perhaps civil society can continue carrying this um, trust and safety movement forward to protect election integrity. Thanks, Patricia. Do you have anything you want to add? Yes, I think uh, one of the things that's very unfortunate is because there's been so many layoffs in the trust and safety teams that in so many countries, we don't really have people to talk to anymore when you have an emergency in terms of elections. This is one thing. Uh, and and the other thing is, uh, I think the the this on top of the, the hotlines, I think it would be super important to... Uh, somehow and this this means we need to have access to data to see if how is being enforced their moderation policies and all the policies and without access to this data we can't know any of that excellent and Pumzile. the question was what am i most worried about this i mean you you can add that as a question as well is what like what have we learned have we learned the right lessons yeah. them applied what has worked that you hope people will jump onto or what are we missing yeah i think uh so what i'm grappling with at the moment is i'm working on an article around the risks of generative ai and african elections and trying to kind of navigate between the very like dystopian future the end of democracy to um you know it's not that big a problem and trying to find a middle ground and in that research i found that um, the same problems still essentially exist. Um, and if we kind of demonize generative AI as the cause, we look past the, the, the pervasive issues that are still there. Um, disinformation continues to run rampant. Um, content moderation on the African continent uh, is not a local languages. I'm not saying it must be every single language spoken in the on, on, on the continent in specific countries, but the ma major languages need to be covered. Um, and I think in Africa, um, what the platform usually do is that they'll have a very kind of US specific um, program on the US election or they will do the election in Germany. Um, and a colleague just raised this to me now is African countries are often not selected for those kind of programs where there's an ability to kind of look at a country where there's massive risks and have very specific projects for that. So how are those countries chosen? Um, I would, I'm, I'm really worried about that. I am really worried about disinformation going beyond and kind of subverting um, political discourse and manipulating election results. I think for the African continent is that there is the ability of it to cause offline violence um, where it can result in kind of wars, uh, social unrest. Um, so I would really kind of encourage in the four billion people that are going to the polls that um a little bit more kind of attention is given to what's happening on the african continent uh what's happening in ethiopia um i think they, they're one of the countries going to election next year and um, for there to kind of be a greater focus around elections beyond kind of the global north um and hopefully from the monitoring uh, elections in the global south in south africa in uh, mali in burkina faso there's new lessons learned for the global community i think i found it to kind of be siloized where there isn't enough attention focused on other parts of the world where the disinformation conversation is centered on the eu it's centered on the us um, and not other parts of the world 
Um, so that's that's a big worry for me. I mean, lessons learned, but there's more lessons to learn. Um, as as Kate has said, panic, but panic responsibly. I'm trying my best. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you raised that. I'm going to come back to generative AI because I'm guessing it's a question that everyone has since we've all been uh, perhaps thrown into the everything AI everywhere once a year. Um, but before we go back to that, you raised um, that the concerns that generate online can transfer into the offline world and result in violence. And in terms of lessons learned, just to say, you know, in the United States in 2020, I remember working very closely with former colleagues of mine from uh, many countries around the world that had for years been working on questions of uh, uh, political violence and particularly around elections, helping those of us in the United States transfer 20, 30, 40 years of lessons that have nothing to do with the internet and everything to do with societies into the United States to manage very real fears over violence. Um, and so I think your point on it's not just about the lessons learned necessarily in the West being transferred to the majority world, but rather that we all eventually will have to deal with whatever happens online anywhere in the world, uh, eventually makes it to your shore, to your border, to your home. Uh, and so it very much is a community practice. Um, to that end, I'm actually kind of curious for the rest of the group, you mentioned generative AI and then went straight to the point that a lot of the things we need to do to respond to harms that you may be focused on when it comes to how AI might be applied in an election, uh, frankly, aren't necessarily particularly technical. Um, I know in 2016, there was a lot of talk in 2018, 20, elsewhere in the world about e even today, obviously, foreign interference as a, as a major concern. Um, but we also found in places where you were worried about trust that there's a danger in over-indexing on a threat, right? That everyone believes that anything bad that happens online is like a Russian troll or something. And then it makes it easier to discount when someone says something that you disagree with. Um, do you worry that we're walking into a similar dynamic when it comes to AI? Uh, and I'm curious what you think people should do right now in coming into 2024. What do you think from what you've seen on the ground, from the places that you're in, we should be doing and thinking about to right size and make sure that we are paying attention to what AI could change about elections for us without making everyone so afraid of everything they see online that they don't believe uh, anything coming from anyone? Who wants to take that really impossible question first? Pumzil laughs, so she gets it. <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer. Um, like I said, I'm I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, find a middle ground, be and not just panic uh, irresponsibly, or just think, oh no, it's not an issue. Um, and I'm still trying to quantify if that's even possible to quantify the project, uh, to quantify the problem. And what I'm just looking now and I'm trying to look at is pieces of generative uh, AI content content, and whether or not it has um, resulted in disinformation. I think it's about saying this is another problem we need to look at, but we shouldn't, like I've said before, we shouldn't demonize it as if that's the only problem. There's still kind of solutions that we've spoken about for a very long time. Uh, proper content, content moderation, digital literacy, um, you know, re regulations uh, to hold social media uh, platforms accountable. So I think it's about acknowledging that the, the same old problems still exist and mitigating against those and looking at generative AI and trying to strategize what could be done against that. Um, I think it would be too late to just say, you know, wait and see, we'll see what happens during the 2024 election cycle. Um, and we hope this is not going to be that big of a problem to plan and say, you know, this could be a risk. How do we conscientize people about generative AI without freaking them out? Um, so a form of uh, AI inoculation, I don't know what if, if that's even <laughs> a phrase. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, kind of letting people know that this is a form of disinformation that might be there. And I think it's particularly my thing that I'm really worried about is audio 
uh, you know, audio, AI generated audio, which is notoriously, would be notoriously difficult to debunk in, in, in Africa in particular. Because I think if it's something on social media, you can look at it and you can say this image is manipulated. Look, this thing has five, this person has five fingers. With audio, it's far more difficult. Um, so that's something we need to put our heads together and, and figure out. Yeah, and that's certainly been the case for a long time, that audio has been uh, harder for companies to moderate. Uh, Patricia, I wonder if I could go to you with the impossible giant question. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, I Well, I agree with you, Rose, and with Fumzile. Um, one of the things, uh, I think, and this is controversial in the U.S., but one of the things that might be important uh, in many countries is to keep the communication channels clear between electoral authorities and the platforms. I mean, this is not uh, trying to exert pressure or anything. It's just to, you know, we have an emergency. There's this uh, fake, deep fake uh, video going viral or something. You need to have this communi communication channel so that you have a rapid response. And I do agree that there's a tendency to demonize AI and, and generative AI. And if you think of it, um, the main issue might still be uh, political actors who are weaponizing uh, social media. Uh, if they're using or not generative AI uh, for this, it's still you know the same political actors weaponizing it. So um, it's still the same problem. It might be a little bit more advanced technologically, but it's still the same problem. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Kay, I wonder if I can throw the impossible question to you. Sure. Um, I mean, I think the the Gen AI question is really more of an issue of the, you know, velocity and volume, scale and speed of the problems that we've seen for decades. Um, and so, you know, I'll take this opportunity to plug the importance of allowing for independent citizen observation of elections um, and offer an analog example of how this has been successful. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the top, you know, observation missions have the potential to reduce post-election violence by providing independent evidence that support or refute claims that the official results have been manipulated. And in 1990, in Bulgaria, the first post-communist elections, the um, the the incumbent party won, the Socialist Party won. The opposition was certain that they were going to win, and when they didn't, um, you saw demonstrations in the street in the streets. Um, however, independent observation confirmed that the the opposition party did lose but they weren't cheated from the election and so with that news demonstrators went home they were they trusted the independent um election observation results and um were able to avoid electoral violence i think i hope that um you know the the closing space for citizen election observation is concerning. I think the increased surveillance surveillance of um, election observers is concerning me. I think if we can can provide support and protection for citizen observation, I'm hopeful for 2024. Um, you know, I will say the good news is um, authoritarians don't understand civil society. And I think it's because of that that they underestimate their power um, and what they can do. And so I think one of the greatest tools to protect 2024 elections and beyond is for platforms in particular to not forget to partner with them as as a way to, to protect election integrity. That's great. We're we're coming up close on time. So I think from this conversation, summarizing that there's been a, a discussion of how important it is for civil society and the public to have better information, access to data and understanding of how companies are operating. It's important to set up uh, predictable channels of communication and process uh, so that when bad things happen, people know who to call, whether that's within the government or within companies. We've talked about how important it is not to lose sight of all of the places that often get short drift on resourcing, language coverage, and support uh, that may need those contacts more than anyone else in those urgent moments. We've talked about right-sizing um, AI and threats in general in the context of making sense of our information space in elections. Uh, we've certainly spoken about trust and, and how do you build good trust without silencing necessary voices of opposition and transparency. 
Um, and I'm sure I'm missing many, 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 many more things. So before we go, I wonder if each of our panelists can give a super, super quick last word. What is it that you most wish those watching today would keep their eyes on or keep in mind for 2024? Let's go backwards. So Pumzila, Patricia, Kay. Africa. <laughs> That's the always my advice. <laughs> we matter. We're here too. Um, <laughs> so I would just encourage that as part of, you know, I think it's a election notes uh, wet dream next year. Um, there's just so much to look at. Um, I just like to really encourage that. Also, keep an eye on what's going on in Africa, um, and you know, when there are issues that need highlighting in the global community, let's do that. Thank you, Patricia. I think um, we should encourage and support the role of civil society and journalists in being watchdogs during elections in terms of how our platforms enforcing their policy. Is the government, you know, using uh, uh, this information as an excuse to implement authoritarian rules? Uh, how is that being uh, uh, implemented? So just support uh, civil society and, and journalists in, in that role. Thank you, Kay. Um, yeah, like Pumzile was saying, keep an eye on the small elections as well. Um, also to platforms, I would ask that you keep in mind the election cycle um, doesn't end on election day. It goes through the transition of power as well. So keep, keep at it. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to all of you for giving of your time. This is a really excellent conversation. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, I'm excited now to turn it over to my long running friend and collaborator, Sydney Olenek, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Duco, which has done really important work in partnership with many of the companies we've talked about today as they try and figure out exactly what they're supposed to do in this increasingly complex, fast moving world. Uh, Sydney will be leading us into our next and last session. Sydney, thank you so much. Thank you, Rose and Pumzile and Patricia and Kay for that really interesting discussion. As Rose mentioned, we're gonna shift over to talk more about industry, but I can't emphasize enough how important the experience and work across civil society uh, and many other stakeholder groups is when it comes to protecting democracy, human rights, and information integrity. So I'm sure many of the themes you discuss will continue to touch on here. As Rose mentioned, um, I am the CEO and founder of Duco. At Duke, our mission is to empower leading companies to operate safely, securely, and responsibly by mobilizing the world's leading experts to help solve complex challenges. Uh, at Duco, we actually have a lot of uh, robust elections programs. We provide a lot of surge capacity and localization support, including uh, access to on-the-ground support and local language support. So everything you guys uh, mentioned there is um, very, very close to home for me as well. For the next 30 minutes, we're going to hear from two industry leaders who work at two of the largest internet companies in the world. And our goal for this discussion is to provide you all with more information on what happens on the inside of these companies. So how they prioritize, prepare and mitigate risks during elections, what have internet or in what uh, they have learned and in internet companies in general have learned from past elections and what role localization plays for these companies uh, and, and of course, how they work with civil society and think about information integrity um, in general and across a number of their different products. So I'll quickly introduce them and we'll also um, ask them to explain a lot more about the different things that they're working on internally. So first, uh, Amy Larson, who is joining us from Democracies or from Microsoft's Democracy Forward team, where she's the director of strategy. She leads the team's cyber elections and information integrity strategy and the team's global engagement efforts. Uh, she is a lawyer by training, served in the Obama White House, uh, was a Fulbright in Korea and a congressional um, in a congressional fellowship and was and also served at the State Department. And Angela, who we have joining us from Google, is the director of trust and safety research and partnerships, where she leads the company's efforts to partner with industry, academia and civil society to address societal harms. Angela brings systems thinking and technology risks coming to Google to stand up cross product trust and safety intelligence function. And before uh, Google, she actually worked for a decade at Microsoft, uh, developing their cybersecurity policies and initiatives, um, though Amy and Angela never crossed paths at Microsoft. So they just recently met. Uh, so Angela, I'll actually start with you to kick everything off. Can you just help set the stage for everyone in the audience and tell us a little bit more about your role um, at the company 
and also um, particularly how it relates to elections. And so including any relevant products, policies, processes, or stakeholder groups that you manage or engage. Absolutely. And first, obviously, let me thank the DFR Lab, Katie over at Anchor Change, and Duco for having us on this panel. Um, my role, as um, Sydney introduced, is leading our trust and safety research and partnerships team. So what does that really mean? That means I have a set of folks who do research. We do first party and third party research that works on improving civic partners. Uh, civic processes. And I also have a team of analysts, and these analysts are responsible for partnering with academics and civil societies to establish and manage flagging programs that help identify potentially problematic content or potentially problematic behavior, flagging that additional local context and language and local issues around elections that we just heard about from the previous panel into the mothership. Um, we are one of many teams um, that contribute as part of the large community here at Google working on elections, and that overall process is deftly orchestrated by my colleague, Dave Warhouse. Thank you, Angela. And Amy, same question to you. Sure, and thank you so much for having me as well. really appreciate the opportunity to um, speak with everyone here and uh, really appreciated the, the first panel as well, getting to hear those insights and perspectives. Um, so as Sidney mentioned, uh, I'm Amy Larson. I lead uh, strategy for the Democracy Forward team uh, with a particular focus on our international work. Um, let me first describe a little bit about where uh, this team is situated within the company, uh, and then we can dive more deeply into some of the election specific um, issues and, and recent announcements as well. Um, so the Democracy Forward team lives within an organization called Technology for Fundamental Rights, and that's really aiming to use data and technology to protect uh, fundamental rights um, and institutions as well. Um, and then the Democracy Forward team in particular um, works to preserve, protect, and advance the fundamentals of democracy. Um, there are three main ways that we try to do this. Um, one is by trying to promote a healthy information ecosystem. So that involves work on uh, digital literacy, journalism, um, and uh, information integrity. Um, we also work on safeguarding open and secure democratic processes. That's where a lot of our election related work uh, lives. Um, and then advocating for corporate civic responsibility. Um, and that includes both some internal and externally focused efforts to um, promote civic engagement, use interesting tools and technology to um, uh, make sure that people are registered to vote uh, and have access to authoritative election information as well. Um, and then in addition to that work across the team, um, we've also been helping uh, to support the company's Ukraine response as well. Uh, and of course, thinking about how we can continue to um, deploy AI responsibly in the service of the different um, uh, systems and, and programs we've been talking about so far. Um, I also want to note uh, some exciting announcements that we made a, a few weeks ago, um, our Microsoft election protection uh, commitments, and those are based around um, helping to safeguard voters, candidates, and campaigns, uh, as well as election authorities worldwide. Um, and so we're really thinking about um, how we can deploy technology tools uh, to really um, bolster and promote and defend um, a number of different key democratic stakeholders. Um, we do all of this in a nonpartisan way, um, and uh, both in the United States and overseas, uh, abroad internationally also. I'll pause there and we can dive more that's deeply in. Yeah, that's really helpful. And we'll make sure to share those resources with everyone as well. So um, stay tuned on that. Uh, Amy, I want to start with you on this next question. I know you mentioned a number of things that you guys are doing today. How has the company and, and in general, like technology platforms role in the de democratic process changed over time? And how have, you know, stakeholder expectations evolved as well? I imagine when you joined this team, um, it looked very different than it does today. So if you can walk us through um, that evolution, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I think that's a great, great question. Um, so I think like many um, uh, industries, uh, I think technology being one of them, um, elections and democratic processes, um, everything has undergone this kind of digital transformation. Um, and I don't think that, you know, Microsoft sort of set out as a company that uh, was intending to um, uh, be involved in uh, 
democracy related efforts and election related efforts, um, even in a nonpartisan way. I, it wasn't necessarily part of the, the mission uh, when uh, when we were first established. But, you know, I think an example uh, of our recent involvement in, in Ukraine really highlights um, sort of why why we've um, risen to the occasion. Um, and, you know, uh, we were able to see the, the first um, the, the cyber attack on Ukraine that preceded the kinetic in, uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, from our Microsoft headquarters. Um, six hours before the tanks rolled across uh, Ukraine's borders. Um, and so, you know, we realized in that, um, uh, and we'd been working with Ukraine's uh, security team as well, of course, for, for many years before that. Um, but we realized that, you know, we really, whether we've chosen this role or not, um, technology is, is fundamentally part of the um, digital uh, underpinnings of, of democracies. Um, and that, uh, you know, it's really important for the sake of security of our customers and um, uh, those who rely on Microsoft products and the internet and uh, Outlook and, and the devices that we use and servers as well that carry so much of our, uh, the lifeblood of our economy uh, today that, um, you know, we have to put, uh, continue to put security of those systems front and center. Um, so, so it really is a, um, uh, a decision based in both the business proposition of uh, democracy, uh, companies being in business being good for democracy, and 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 likewise recognizing that uh, the stability of you know kind of uh, contract regimes and um, legal processes in democracies um, are also good for business as well. So it's it's in part a recognition of um, you know this is just where we are that uh, in in the sort of life cycle as you put up put it, um, Sydney uh, that you know. We have to be involved in um, uh, in stepping up to the plate to create a an impact and a positive one, um, you know. And so, uh, one of the pieces of our election protection commitments um, is developing an election communication hub. So, um, those who are uh, experiencing any elections related um, crisis or or uh, situation that they need technical assistance with have a direct line uh, into our team um, and our partners across the company that are helping protect the security of elections uh, and election systems so that we can help respond. Um, so it's it's in part being able to respond quickly to anything that comes up uh, and also, of course, developing relationships and processes um, way in advance. So even though uh, Election Day for the United States is, is a year away, um, you know, we've been working uh, within the company, of course, already for, for uh, quite a while to continue to shore up our teams and systems and make sure that we're really well prepared to take care of um, our clients and wherever we're involved technically. Wow, oh, thank you. And Angela, same same for you. I know Google has also made a number of changes uh, over time and, and curious to hear more about what that has looked and felt like, especially um, with some of the partner organizations and collaborations that you are working on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things is people have been looking to Google to provide and find quality information for over 25 years. I got a really awesome cupcake when I was in the office recently that had that number on it. But I think when we think about elections, I think a couple of things are really important. This is a long standing investment that has a well established playbook and it is fundamentally global in nature. And so really there are three key, key pillars for us to be thinking about whenever we're thinking about elections. How do we connect voters to election information? How do we help campaigns enhance their security? And how do we protect our platforms for abuse? I think it'd be interesting to maybe give an example or two in each area, as I know that we will come to other questions that touch on this. First, when you think about connecting people to information, I think this is obviously really, really key. We work in a nonpartisan way with third party data partners, ultimately to aggregate official data directly from election administrators and really make sure that we are linking to official websites to provide that information. Another way that we connect voters with information is making sure that third party developers can use an API, the Google Civics Information API, to really create apps that also help users connect to official information. In our second area, enhancing campaign security, you know, we have commissioned a study in 2022 that noted that 85% of professionals working in politics and journalism felt they needed stronger cybersecurity, and 83 felt like their the threats had increased in just the previous two years. 
So when thinking about that, there's at least two programs that we have, the Advanced Protection Program, as well as Titan Security Keys that really help campaigns officials protect themselves in email and then also protect their devices. We're also constantly monitoring the internet, working to enter, uh, disrupt account hijackings, inauthentic activity, influence operations, all of those different things. And then finally, we do things to protect the platform for abuse. And this is a lot of what I think people think traditionally is the trust and safety work. So we have strict policies against things like voter suppression, deceptive practices, and facilitating or promoting online violence. And you'll hear a little bit more when we talk uh, maybe about AI, about some of our more recent improvements. I think one of the things, again, that's really important here is longstanding and constantly working and learning and improving. Um, one of the things I'll note from my four years here at Google is our work to improve what we do in intelligence associated with local elections. And that's one of the things I think we've really driven forward and also really working to make sure that we are operating as one as a company. And so just a couple of things that I think are really important in our three commitments and some of the activities in each. Thank you, Angela. So that was, I think, like a very helpful broad picture of some of the things that you guys are working on. I would like to get a little bit more concrete for this next question. Uh, as we look ahead to 2024 specifically, what are your team's key goals and priorities when it comes to those elections? Assuming we can't do, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, but just just like concretely, what are like some of the absolute um, most critical priorities? Um, and we'll start. Go ahead, Angela. We can start with you. Yeah, yeah. I think fundamentally, when we look at 2024, it doesn't differ a lot than what you heard in the previous panel that what's different is not necessarily our approach. It is a consistent approach using those three pillars. But what really is different is the sheer number of elections that are going on. I think the scale and speed um, of adaptation that we will need to be thinking about is different. And also, you know, just the real challenge. And again, this was talked about, I think, really nicely in Katie's opening, that this online environment is reflecting the real world challenges that we're seeing, where you have nationalism hate and harassment, targeting of vulnerable populations that is not only harming the elections process, but also disenfranchising, as we heard in the previous panels, participants in that process. And so again, we really think about leveraging a playbook, making sure that we are connecting voters to information, helping campaigns and protecting our platform. And what we're looking at as we face 2024 is just a different volume and a different speed moving through that. Yeah, and Angela, actually, just to uh, just one one step further on that, and Amy, we'll circle back to you in a second. On that front, what role does localization play in elections for mm -hmm. you and your team, and how are you guys prioritizing effectively, like localizing without having to boil the whole ocean? Um, just considering the the scale and and the things that you just mentioned. Yes, Sydney, that's actually where my team really does come to play. Um, you know, again, that approach is global, but we are always working collectively across the company to augment that global approach with local context, understanding a local election, local election processes, becoming familiar with the candidates and issues in play. For my team specifically, um, we perform surveys um, that really do on the ground research locally to support understanding that local context. Um, who are, what are the issues at play? Who are the candidates? And really working really closely with civil society organizations and academics to help bring them in to things like flagging programs that'll help us gain that local language context and also the cultural nuance. And that becomes particularly effective when you're uh, particularly important when you're thinking about, as we were just saying, the 83 global elections on, uh, excuse me, 83 elections on a global basis. One of the areas we've seen this particularly be effective is in Central and Eastern Europe, a region that, as you all know, is very rife with disinformation. These kind of flagging programs can be very helpful. Finally, and it's not necessarily my team, but I do want to highlight that the partnership between the global operations and the local teams in each region or country are really, really key. That's where, when you need to... Um, 
adapt and be responsive on the ground, those local partnerships are ultimately helps what is what helps these be effective. Thank you. And Amy, same to you, uh, priorities, goals, and if it is in aligned, also just helping us understand how you guys handle localization as well. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for thanks for the question. And I think, um, you know, for, for people who have worked in that kind of the cyber or security field, um, uh, it's, it's often uh, difficult to sort of celebrate success because it looks very quiet if you've succeeded, right? Um, so in, in some ways, what we're hoping for is, um, uh, you know, obviously we've talked about Voterama with, um, you know, 2 billion people who have the opportunity to go to the polls, mm -hmm. which is uh, wonderfully exciting and uh, a boon for democracy, but it also is uh, clearly a very large threat landscape as well. Um, and, and so, you know, um, we're going to continue to uh, do what we've been doing for many of the past election cycles, um, both uh, abroad and the United States, um, also uh, making a really big push to surface authoritative information on Bing, um, connecting with um, reputable um, uh, nonpartisan sources here and abroad uh, in order to elevate uh, authoritative content regarding how to vote and where to vote and, and all of those um, nuts and bolts, um, you know, in order to avoid kind of uh, uh, a crisis, um, you know, I think doing the preparation that we were talking about before where, um, you know, this isn't you know, the election day, if the election is, you know, next week, uh, you're already too late if you're starting to prepare. Uh, so it's it's really doing advanced preparation, really understanding um, the local um, uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, you know, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that, um, you know, that um, there are 2.7 billion people uh, who don't have the internet. And so um, I think we have to be aware of uh, all sorts of different degrees of technical um, connection and, um, and, and also fluency with digital and media literacy. So that's an area that we work on a lot, um, both in terms of AI and um, other uh, tool sets to, to help people make sense of the information environment. Um, you know, that's truly the, the, the crux of localization is actually empowering citizens to understand the information environment that they're in um, on election day and every other day so that they can um, understand how to consume and share information uh, in ways that don't propagate um, uh, influence operations and, uh, and, and, and efforts to undermine and divide us. Um, so I think success, you know, we'll continue to um, kind of uh, in, build the programs that we have. Uh, our account guard program is a threat detection and notification service that's available at no additional uh, cost to the institutions that underpin democracy, such as political parties, uh, election officials, campaigns, uh, journalists, and nonprofits. Um, that's active in 33 countries and promote uh, protects over uh, 5 million inboxes. Um, and we're going to continue to keep building out these tools to help people um, uh, really uh, be able to engage um, in the information ecosystem. Um, one other set of work that we do, which is really exciting, is um, work with internally uh, with partners like Bing and Xbox. Um, and in the 2022 midterm elections, we used these partnerships to register uh, 50,000 people to vote and also recruited um, over 800 poll workers with LinkedIn. Um, so I think we're really trying to use these technologies to um, uh, make sure that people can uh, participate as much as possible. Um, we'd like to see elections be free, fair, absent from foreign, interfer foreign interference um, and to, to help um, triage whenever uh, something has gone wrong on the technical side as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that ongoing education is really critical and um, kind of daunting when you think about how many billions of you got users you guys are both um, have access to. Uh, I want to shift gears and uh, jump into headlines and ask the obligatory question about um, artificial intelligence. Uh, and very curious from your perspective, how you think AI is affecting the or will potentially affect the elections in 2024, and how you guys are uh, mitigating harm um, in, in in those effects. And I know in the last panel they touched on a number of of things along these lines, including how in certain cases like the harms are are similar. Uh, but just wondering what your take is on on that. And we'll start, um, Amy. We can actually start with you this time. Sure. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I think like all new technologies, um, you know, they can be, they're kind of agnostic um, in many ways uh, in terms of how they're deployed, right? So I think it can be, uh, as, as our president of our company likes to say, either a tool or a weapon. Um, you know, uh, I think we don't know exactly how um, AI will affect the elections, but um, because it is a, a productivity enhancing tool, um, it will amplify and accelerate um, the actions of both the good guys and the bad guys. Um, so we have to kind of be ready for that. Um, you know, I think uh, the good news is that, you know, Microsoft sees about 65 trillion signals of uh, digital activity um, and is tracking about um, 300 um, nation state threat actors. Uh, and that's actually really hard to do if you only are using, you know, person hours. Um, you know, we've got 10,000 security professionals, but to go through 65 trillion signals a day is, uh, is a lot of work. So um, AI is really useful in helping to quickly make sense of these signals. Um, and so is providing a real um, boost for security and for defenders. Uh, of these systems. So we're, we're hopeful that um, that'll really enable us to help protect um, the digital landscape um, more effectively and respond more quickly as well to incidents um, uh, if and when they, they do occur. Um, you know, and I think, uh, I think we want to continue the media literacy efforts as well for people of, of all ages. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is increase awareness of um, uh, watermarking. So that's to help people um, trust in content that's created by people and also to be really clear about when content is created by AI. So we have commitments to label um, both of those. Um, and I hope that uh, will continue to help give people confidence um, and at least be informed in what they're thinking about and reading and seeing. Um, and that will continue to promote trust rather than uh, than the opposite. Angela? Yeah, um, I think like Amy said, we don't necessarily know exactly how, but we know that the technology is agnostic and it will uh, accelerate speed and scale. And so I think a couple of things that we are working to do to mitigate this harm. First is really empower voters to have more information that helps them think about the information environment. Um, Amy just talked about their political ads policy. Um, we also have a political ads disclosure policy. What that really is focusing on is making sure that advertisers disclose when their elections ads include material that has been digitally altered, altered or generated, including through the use of generative AI tools. And this is on top of the ad disclosure policies for election ads that already include the paid for by disclosure. We think that this helps provide, again, additional context about the ads. Another space that we're investing in is in meta metadata associated with content. Whether this content is an image, whether this content is a page, or whether this content is a particular result, we are providing, when we have it, this useful context, such as a description of how the response was generated generated or where the content came from that can be viewed through about this features in many of our tools, whether that is again through an image search or through the search features itself. And then finally, like Amy talked about, we are also investing in watermarking. AI is unleashing a new set of risk um, and the spreading of false information. And so Google DeepMind has just launched SynthID, a tool for experimental watermarking to identify AI generated images. Um, this combination of policies and interventions to help improve the user experience is one set of actions. We also consistent with what I already talked about are always working to lift up authoritative sources. And then finally, you know, just like participating in this panel here today and the wonderful set of folks who've all joined in, this is about working as an ecosystem, whether that is the ecosystem of the big tech companies who are doing a lot in LLMs, Anthropic, Microsoft, OpenAI, and Google helped launch the Frontier Model Forum and also has set up a new AI safety fund with more than $10 million to help promote research in this field. Individually, Google is also thinking about how to catalyze this broader ecosystem with a $20 million digital futures fund through our .org organization, 
really working to catalyze that ecosystem of research and discussion about AI safety, security, and responsibility. Again, I think it's going to be a complex 2024 with the number of elections and the changes in the technology and ecosystem. At the same time, though, it's about running that playbook and being ready to adapt. Thank you, Angela. Uh, in 30 seconds or less, as we're coming up on time here, uh, Amy, can you start uh, for folks in the audience that are working on elections or uh, really care about these issues, uh, whether they work at platforms or in civil society or other organizations, uh, do you have any advice for ways they can contribute in their respective organizations or in general on um, these issues as we look ahead to 2024? Yeah, this is such a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I mean, there's so much in life that's outside of our control, um, but actually in this space, I think everyone has a really important role to play no matter where you sit. Um, you know, this is this is exactly the moment to not feel powerless because while nobody can do everything, everyone can do something, whether that's uh, as part of your work or whether that's, um, you know, volunteering uh, in your free time and making sure to um, update your voter registration or serve as a poll worker um, or, you know, having some hard conversations over over the holidays about um, sharing responsible sources of information um, in family chats or with friends or, or uh, what, what have you. Um, I mean, I think this is, democracy is really a team sport and uh, it really, we really, this is the moment where people need to show up. And um, I would say in addition to the panic responsibly, I would say act, share, speak and engage responsibly um, because they're all really needed and everyone here can do them. And that's really absolutely needed. Yeah, I'll just add on, um, you know, again, I think this is one of those spaces where individually and collectively we can make change. I loved hearing that this panel had so many different participants signed up for it. I think in addition to that, as an individual, invest in understanding the issues at play in your region, your part of the world, and invest in finding out who the authoritative sources are in your region. And then, as Amy just said, whether it's sitting it down at a holiday meal or sharing it in your community, this is an opportunity to really help improve and have good hygiene in the information environment and to support each other. And so I really thank again, DFR Lab, Katie, and um, DUCO for having this panel and encourage everyone um, to, again, learn the issues in your space, learn the authoritative sources and engage. Thank you guys. Thank you, Angela. And thank you, Amy, so much for your time. We are over time. So uh, I will turn it over to Katie Harbath and just want to say that I hope this is the beginning of a conversation that with this community uh, across 2024. And as Amy just mentioned, democracy is a team sport. So uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Sydney. And thanks to all of our panelists for a fantastic conversation. So many things that we learned and issues to make sure that we're paying attention to with all of the elections happening next year in 2024. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, a little reminder to make sure that you follow DFR Lab and their work at dfrlab.org. They're also on all of the social media channels, as Graham mentioned at the beginning, so make sure you follow them. You can follow my newsletter at anchorchange.substack.com. Um, and we will also be sending out a follow-up email with links to a lot of the resources that we mentioned mentioned in some of the work that the platforms have already announced around their work on elections. But I want to, again, thank you all for joining us and hope you have a really great day.